Hi everyone. Thank Hi. you for coming today. Um, continue eating your lunches as we talk. It's a lunch and learn. So I think we're the learning part. Um, my name is Wendy Watson. I'm an associate professor of gerontology at BGSU. And I'm fortunate today to have brought along with me three wonderful students. So we have Elena, Raise. Hello. <laughs> and Sarah with an H and Sarah with not an H. Okay. <laughs> and they will be talking momentarily um, about some of their experiences. So I'm very glad to have them with us. So we were asked to talk about ageism. And so we're going to talk about that for, I don't know, a couple of days if y'all are ready to stay put. There's a lot of information that we could cover. On the next slide, I have just a brief outline of what we're going to be doing. So I know it looks like a lot, but, um, and I, I put more information on the slides than I typically would because I know you're eating and crunching and you've got things going on. And so this way, I thought it might be easier for us to kind of discuss things. And we are planning on leaving some time at the end for questions if you have them or comments from your own experiences. We would love to hear those. As well as as we're going, if you have questions, by all means, you don't have to wait till the end. You're welcome to ask us questions. Okay. And so introductions, we've already done that. On the next slide, let's start talking about some definitions. I introduce oh, that my own order. Now I know this is really small and I would chastise mm -hmm. people for doing this. Try to fit too much on a slide. What we wanted to talk about first are some definitions. Okay. So these are things that we talk about. And we probably all kind of have our own idea of what definitions or what they mean. But for ageism, we could look at that as prejudice or discrimination based on a person's age. Now, we tend to think of that as older adults, right? People are ageist against older adults, but it could be across the age spectrum. And so I think some of the experiences that the students may be talking about our ageism that they've experienced as younger people, okay? So we look at it across kind of the age spectrum. And then um, Danielle in the write-up for today had a really nice little synopsis of kind of prejudice is how we feel, discrimination is how we act, and stereotypes are how we think. But to take those a little bit more in depth, so prejudice, right? An unfavorable opinion that or feeling that we form before we actually know much. Right, before we know about people as individuals. So a preconceived opinion or feeling, now it can be favorable. Very often we think of them as unfavorable. And so affective feelings toward a person, and that is based on their perceived group membership, right? So when you hear someone say, you know, all college students are dot, 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 without knowing them individually. All older adults are, all women are, all right? So any sort of group where, we take an individual and just assume they fit, right? Um, because of the, the membership. And then discrimination is how we act. So this is based off stereotypes very often, and it is unjust or presidential, presidential, hmm, prejudicial treatment of different people, different categories of people. And we think about this, I think, like in the workplace, right? So discrimination about people who are older in the workplace and what that must mean, right? So we hear it in that way, or we sometimes hear that associated with race or with gender. And then, as I said, often based on stereotypes, so how we think, unfair and untrue belief that many people have about all people or things with a particular characteristic, a generalized belief about a particular category of people. And so research has shown that we all have these, we all hold these, that one of the best ways to dispel stereotypes is to spend time with people of that group. So when people say, you know, all college students are, well, one of the best ways to dispel that myth or stereotype is to actually spend time with students in that age group or people in that age group. And then you get to know them individually, how much they vary, how much they all aren't, right? What's a common one? You know, those college kids they are all downtown getting drunk on the weekends, right? We, we know the stereotype. Now, does that mean each student is? No, of course not. And so once we get to know people individually, research has shown that's really helpful in, disp in dispelling those stereotypes. Okay, so on the next slide, let's see. We also know that ageism can vary according to a situation. So when we take apart or tease apart ageism, we can think of it in a couple of ways, more hostile 
So when we act toward people in a hostile way, so openly aggressive behaviors um, based on our beliefs about age, and again, the example, you know, teenagers, you know how teenagers are, they're all that, that, that. But we can also see ageism enacted in what we would call a benevolent way. So I'm going to argue that people aren't necessarily doing this deliberately. They're trying to be kind. However, they're treating people in a particular way because of their age and it is often patronizing mm -hmm. right so if somebody walks up they they visualize they see what who they think might be an older adult based on physical characteristics and they offer to help you across the street come on ma'am let me help you across the street right and your response is i'm good i don't need help right you haven't asked for help and so it's treatment of an older adult based on assumptions based on stereotypes and so it Benevolent because it's meant to be kind, but it's still ages, it's still patronizing, right? Talking down to you, treating you as less than, and as it says, such that older adults are childlike and require guidance. And so we'll talk more about that um, in a moment. So again, kind of thinking of ageism in multiple ways. So what are the impacts of ageism? There's been some research that has looked at this, and in fact, no, I'm not going to read you the book, but um, I, and I can certainly give Danielle some more resources if anyone's interested, but this is a researcher. Her name is Becca Levy, Levy, and what she's looked at, in fact, the book says how your beliefs about aging determine how long and how well you'll live. So internalized ageism is the idea of internalizing those messages, and we've heard them our whole lives, right, about older adults and what later life or midlife is supposed to be like, and so Internalized ageism means we internalize those things. And so we see ourselves as whatever those stereotypes are, right? And, and very much so less than. So a person internalizes those ageist beliefs, applies them to themselves and perhaps to their same aged peers. And so what this says is, is that we're embracing social norms that devalue or marginalize, okay? And we have, and we see the same thing. We could look at other groups of identity. So internalized sexism, internalized racism. The idea is that I act in a way and I take in those beliefs and then I act accordingly. So I act as someone who needs help when maybe I don't need it because society's told me, right? That's what an older adult does, okay? Now, elder speak is a term that was actually coined by Dr. Levy. And this is infantilizing, so particularly geared toward older adults, infantilizing them through the use of simpler language. So seeing an older adult, seeing those cues of whatever we think an older adult looks like or right, an assistive device, for example, and we use simpler language in talking to them. We equate older adults, mm, older adults have hearing loss, right? And this is without knowing them individually, okay? So this research has been done with asking people or observing people, particularly in healthcare settings, about how they perceive and act toward older adults. And again, elder speak is, I don't know you, but I know that you are an older adult. So I'm going to use simpler language because I know that you probably slowed down, <laughs> right? Okay. Now, if I'm working with someone with cognitive impairment and they do need me to go more slowly, that's different right? Or if I have an uncle and he has hearing loss, and so I speak in a particular way because I know that about him. This is, I don't really know this person, but I'm going to speak more loudly because you know older people, right? And so, and you can see shorter sentences, simplified grammar, exaggerated pitch and intonation, slowing down and repeating. And what the impacts are is that largely older adults say they feel patronized, they feel infantilized, they feel insulted. Now, again, if I know you and I know that you need some assistance in a particular area, that's different. But in this particular way, it's kind of adopting this speech because you're an older adult. And again, I'm going to group this kind of in the benevolent ageism. I'm trying to speak to you in a way that I think we can communicate better. But again, I'm grouping everybody into one clump. And we have a lot of heterogeneity among groups of people. So some people can hear better than others, right? At any age and so on with the different characteristics. And so the impacts then 
we find, um, particularly if older adults do have cognitive impairment, we see kind of an increase in, in feelings of shame and lack of agency and feeling demeaned. So something else you want to keep in mind. All right. One of the really, um, I don't know, I think it's all important. One of the important things, one of the things that's been studied a lot are what are the health outcomes, right? So we could say this doesn't make people feel good and nobody wants that. But as far as measuring things, like how, how does it really impact people? And we mentioned discrimination. So discrimination is one way that ageism can impact, impact people. But we also know that it is widespread and research that's been done from um, the World Health Organization has found that it's worldwide and it's largely been studied in healthcare, but also found to be rather pervasive in healthcare. And so it affects every aspect from diagnosis to prognosis. So for example, older adults who go to the doctor who aren't believed, right? Or maybe you have an ailment and the doctor says, well, it's just because you're getting older without taking seriously that there is something of concern. We also see this with mental health. So talking to your doctor and it could be depression, it could be treated, but the doctor says, oh, you're just getting older, right? You just got a deal. No, right? Would we talk to a younger adult in that way? Well, maybe unfortunately some in some ways, but as people get older, a lot of things just kind of attributed to, well, you're just getting older. Whereas some things are very treatable. And so unfortunately we find that a lot of physicians are not trained in geriatrics. They really don't understand um, how the body and how the mind might change as we get older. Also perhaps come to the table with their own stereotypes. So we see that it influences healthcare policy, workplace culture, poor health outcomes. So just as a brief, I have like 52 handouts here. Um, this was done, a study was done by the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation at the University of Michigan, and they put out their findings. And this is just one that I put up here. They found that older adults who reported experiencing three or more forms of everyday ageism in their day-to-day -day lives had worse physical and mental health than those who reported fewer forms of ageism. They found, let's see... Um, older adults who experience more forms of ageism are also more likely to have a chronic health condition. They also, those who experienced three or more forms of ageism were less likely than people who re reported fewer forms to rate their mental health as excellent or very good and more likely to report symptoms of depression. So just a little snapshot, they have a, a and again, if you're interested, I'm happy to share some of the information and some of the research. But looking at actual impacts on people's health, so more chronic conditions, poor physical health, poor mental health, because those messages, it's not just one or two messages of ageism, right? It's pervasive. It's pervasive. So it's um, in dealing with people every day. It's in messages we get in media and society. We also can see perhaps some repercussions with social isolation. So if I'm feeling demeaned, if I'm feeling marginalized, if I'm feeling not listened to, maybe I don't try, right? Maybe I don't go to the doctor anymore and ask for help because I've been dismissed the past couple of times. Or if I'm going to social events and being dismissed or devalued because I'm an older adult and people just don't think I have anything useful to say, right? It's an older person. They couldn't possibly know how to use the computer, right? And we all know that those, right, those are or more or are more myths than they are reality. And so sometimes we find then people just kind of isolating because, right, it makes it more difficult. And then differential health treatment. We do have evidence that doctors treat older adults differently than they do younger people. And I've already mentioned maybe dismissing symptoms, maybe not spending as much time with them. Um, I have the students read a, a book in one of my classes and it's called um, Being Mortal. And it's a physician who actually grew up in Ohio and he spends time with like a geriatrician, a palliative care specialist, because he realizes he doesn't really know how to talk to older adults. And he talks about the fact that most people go into medicine to fix things. But as we get older, a lot of what we have may be chronic conditions. You don't fix them. And so that's really hard for physicians. And so a lot of them just, 
That's not what they want to do. And so it's really difficult. And he goes in with a geriatrician who is talking to a patient and, and she comes with a couple, a couple of presenting problems, but he starts talking to her about her life and her meals and how she, you know, who she talks to on a day-to-day -day basis. And he looks in particular, anybody remember? At her feet, that's right. He looks at her feet and he stands out to all of us because if her nails aren't being taken care of, if she has sores on her feet, then it shows that maybe she isn't taking as much care of her hygiene as she could. And the doctor who wrote the book, Dr. Gawande, is just amazed. He's like, people come into the doctor, they have headaches, he talks to them about their headache. And the geriatrician says, no, we want to look at people holistically. We're going to look at their lives. Are they getting proper nutrition? Are they getting proper social engagement? And the doctor who wrote the book was like, wow, it never occurred to him that that was the appropriate way to talk to people, to look at them as whole people. Um, so differential health outcomes, unfortunately. Okay. All right, so what I have asked Sarah, Sarah, and Elena to do <laughs> is to, um, I am, and they have the same middle name, <laughs> and, and their last name starts with the same letter. So I was trying to think of some way, like a different, I know, I know, but luckily they're both terrific. So, um, and they both have long hair. And they both, yeah, yeah. yeah. and they're both wearing sweaters. I don't know, I, I don't know. Um, so what I've asked of them is to kind of talk a little bit about their experiences, and I've left it open. So um, most of them have worked in nursing home facilities, for example, and have worked with older adults in various capacities, but then they've also experienced ageism on the other end as being young adults. So I have asked them just to share a little bit, and they can go in whatever order. I don't remember whatever order we decided. Um, Sarah, with no age, was going to start, so I'm going to try to stand out of the way, so I'm turning it over to them, and then again, we will have time for questions at the end, if you have questions for them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we were debating on doing like a brief little under. Yeah, tell yeah. them just a little yeah. bit about yeah. who you are. So I'm Sarah, with no age, <laughs> and I'm a gerontology student. I am a fourth year, so I graduate. And I want to become a social worker with older adults. I already got accepted into the master program. Um, so I am doing my internship at Woodhaven Healthcare. And I also just recently got hired on as an activities leader as well. And so I interact with older adults a lot there, like all day, 24-7, basically. I've been there, I think, 60 hours this week between doing my internship and just working in general. But I like spending time with them. So I get to interact with them from different sides. One of the things that happened this week is that our Wi-Fi went out. And so because I am a younger adult, they went ahead and was like, oh, you're tech savvy. Go fix the Wi-Fi. <laughs> I cannot fix the Wi-Fi. I barely have to. Yeah, I can't you're not a technician. It. No, I couldn't fix it. And I was like, but you're so young. You're supposed to know everything about technology. And a couple hours later, another resident came up to me. And she said, hey, come fix my computer. And I'm like, oh, I can try. And uh, when she figured out I couldn't fix it, they got very upset. Long story short, we had to have the company come out and fix the Wi-Fi. So just because some of us are young doesn't mean we know everything about technology. We don't know everything. So like some things you guys don't know everything. But that's just one example. Earlier this week, they also spent so much time this week, so there's a lot of things that came up this week. But I've had a lot of time, just like last night, we just sat and talked for a while, and we started just talking about how the world is changing, and about clothes, for example. So there is a popular trend about how they we are crop tops now, and jeans with holes. And so now there's like, oh, all these young kids love crop tops. All these young kids love holes in their jeans and stuff like that. It's like, we want clothes that are only short. We don't want full-length ones. And I was like, I don't like short clothes. I don't like wearing crop tops. I like being fully covered as well. <laughs> like I don't want to be cold outside when I go outside. It's cold here. The wind is atrocious if it's on a windy day. Like, that's not just how it always is, but at least in my experience, that's just a lot of as what I've experienced. It's just like, there's like, oh, they relate to us all as a whole, just because like some people like it doesn't mean all of us do. Right. Yeah, and after that, I asked if I was a part of the Tide Pod generation that ate Tide Pods. 
I don't know if people know how that ghetto is that. There was a whole thing like a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's way younger. They were like little kids eating Tide Pods. Yeah, yeah. The detergent. The yeah, the little detergent. No, 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 It's so, so, I don't want to assume that it would be. Yeah, for the microwave and frozen. They didn't want it better. They didn't want it better. But so they assumed because you were young that you jumped on every trend. And yeah, I do not. I don't even have TikTok. That's how. Yeah, I don't even have TikTok. And they make fun of me for it all the time. But yeah, so we're not all the same. You like different things. That's great. All right, wonderful. Did you I can go. Um, I'm Sarah with an H, and <laughs> I am a communication sciences and disorders major, which, funny enough, is a really wordy way of saying that I'm going to go through, get my master's degree in speech therapy. Um, so I'm a second year, but I will graduate next year. Um, but I have all the grad school stuff afterwards, so I have that to look forward to. Um, and I guess a lot for more of the ageism perspective in my degree and what I've seen through talking to professors and friends and family is the first question is always, um, where do you want to work like post-graduation? And main um, settings are like a school, like an elementary school, or then you go therapy, hospital, the more medical route. And I always tell people that I want to go into hospital. I want to specialize with older adults. And they always, always ask, like, oh, why, why don't you want to go work with kids? Like, do you hate kids? <laughs> and while I love little kids, especially like toddlers, kindergarten, because, of course, like all of them, they're learning language. So there's a lot um, that speech therapists do with that age group. It's not the, they're not the only clientele. And so I just, I'm always bombarded with questions about why I don't want to go work with kids or why I don't want to be in that setting. And I feel like, because I'm also very into the cute um, shirts that you can get on like Etsy that for like speech therapists, it's like everyone has a voice. Like we do. But I think that's super cute, but it kind of like sticks with me because um, that's how you like form relationships, how you maintain healthy relationships communicate with everything so you know what the kids aren't the only ones that need help or therapy um, and I really want to focus on people who have like communicated their whole life and maybe something happened and they no longer can and it's a part of your everyday life that you you just like no longer have and that we take for granted so I mainly want to focus in that area and so I see that all the time with never like I will work with kids, but it's not where I'm focusing on going. Um, and then the other thing that stood out to me with like ageism in my field is I don't know if um, the term motherese has ever been talked about, but we talked about it in one of my classes. And motherese is basically how like a mother will talk to her newborn. Mm -hmm. And we all do. I do it when, you know, there's like a little baby or a little toddler. You say like, oh, what is that? You know, you like raise your voice, you talk loud, very clear so that the young child can understand you. But honestly, I see that, especially like at work, I see that so much with older adults and nine times out of 10, they will look at you and they will say, I'm not deaf. Like I can hear you. They will speak up and I'm proud of them for that. But it's just so normalized that like Dr. Watson was saying that we think we have to simplify or that, you know, all older, adult, all older adults have hearing loss. And I think it's important to advocate that that is not the case. And, you know, I want to be a part of that, like shift to not speak that way because that's not how I would want to be spoken to. And that's not how anyone should be spoken to based on appearance because we do it to toddlers, but why should we do it? 
in that setting. So I just more think of it as my major is so heavily like pediatric based, but I want to move into like specialize in older adults, just everyday life, getting people back on track. And I think communication is so important for that. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Alina. I'm kind of out of the group up here. <laughs> I'm not a Sarah. <laughs> um, I'm a third year senior at BG. I'm a gerontology major. Um, I've had quite a bit of experience with older adults. Um, I started working at Kingston Residence of Sylvania back in 2019. And also took a second job just because I have such a passion for it um, at Woodhaven Healthcare, um, May of 21, I think. So I've been there for coming up on two years now. Um, and I've had several similar experiences with Sarah, um, but actually a little different. So I think after the first week I started working there, a lot of the residents thought I was in my mid 20s, thought I had a family at home, thought I was married. And I was 19, so this just went just right over my head. So I asked the fundamental question, okay, why? <laughs> why do you think that? And they're like, oh, it's the way you hold yourself, the way that you talk to people, the way that you go about things. I'm like, well, how is that different than any other 19-year-old? And it was a good way to really see those predisposed stereotypes they held for other 19-year-olds. Um, they thought I was supposed to always be on my phone, supposed to not be able to talk to people the way that I can talk to people. <laughs> so it was just really eye-opening to see, like, oh, you look, uh, you, you just act a lot older than what you are. So it was really kind of different for me, especially since I'm the older sister. I've always been kind of, I don't know, I've... I don't, when I first started, I was the youngest person in the whole activity department that they had hired. <laughs> so when people were telling me that I was acting old, I was like, hmm, what does that mean? <laughs> so it was definitely an eye-opening experience um, that's a little different than Sarah's. So it was kind of neat to see. Um, and then especially just being a BGSU student, you think of education. BG is known for their education programs. You think of elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, kids, basically. So a lot of my peers were like, oh, well, Leo just works with old people. <laughs> all right, there's a lot of things wrong with that. Let's start with the phrase old people. We all consider old about 15 years younger than what we are. Let's face it. No one's ever going to want to admit to being old. So why do we still use that phrase? There's a lot of older adults, senior citizens. There's just better ways of approaching things. And I feel like that's a big issue of what ageism is. And I was just talking to, um, I don't know his position, but he works at the area office of aging. Um, he asked, is ageism the only ism that's socially acceptable still? Because when you think about it, you go to Meyer or Kroger, you go down the birthday card aisle and you see all forms of ageism. And we laugh about it. Why? Because ageism truly is important. We're all actively aging. So the issues that older adults are facing today, we're going to face eventually. So why do we not care about it? Why are my peers saying that working with kids is up here and working with geriatrics is down here? It just kind of shows either there's a lack of exposure, there's lack of education. And like we were talking about with the being mortal, there's a severe lack of education, especially within the healthcare field on how to work with the geriatric community. And with older adult populations growing rapidly, I think it's becoming a bigger issue than what we expect. So um, I guess going off of that, I don't really have much else to okay. <laughs> but All right, thank you for your input, and we will come back to them. Um, on the next slide, I just wanted to kind of wrap us up in talking about, all right, so if we're saying this is an issue, and as Elena points out, it is an ism that we don't really talk about, right? We talk about right homophobia, we talk about racism, we talk about sexism, um, I mean, not necessarily openly, right? but we are becoming more and more aware of those things. And particularly if you talk to current cohort of younger adults, they see those things as something that they're on top of, right? That are not going to be as prevalent perhaps in their generation. But ageism isn't something we talk about. And yet it is something we all hope to be a part of that group. We all hope to be a part of the older adult group. And with internalized ageism, internalizing those negative, negative messages, we have pretty clear evidence that that's not good for our health. We have evidence and research that people who have more positive thoughts about aging age more positively. 
So what we think makes a difference. So in some of the literature that I was looking at and they were talking about, all right, how do we combat this? Well, education is a big one. Um, and educating ourselves, educating other people, intergenerational contact, as I said, being exposed to people of different age groups lets us know that not everyone is the same, even though intellectually we know that we can get to know people in different age groups. And in fact, a research article that came out recently was talking about reducing ageism, education about aging and extended contact with older adults. And they did intergenerational education and events. And it doesn't have to be formal, right? It can be doing activities together, just getting to know someone who's not like you, for example. And then law and policy changes. So inherent within many of those, and if you are right involved at all with politics and you hear people talking about, you know, we're going to put Social Security, we're going to put Medicare on the table and talk about changing those benefits and Wait a minute. Those policies have done some real good, right? And as a working citizen, you have put money into those policies. And so um, so thinking about how those policies make a difference and at the local level, like the levy that helps support programming at the senior center, right? Things that we invest money in. And so um, and a couple of other things just to kind of think about is being aware of ageism. So again, kind of thinking about how it shapes your own thoughts, feelings, and life experiences, learning more. So this can be by listening to personal stories. It doesn't have to be like I went to the library and got out an article, right? Listening to other people's stories, other people's experiences, reading, researching, um, developing skills. So I think Elena mentioned, or one of you, I'm sorry, mentioned about advocacy, Right, being an advocate for people, and that can be a group of which you are a part, but advocating for rights, for being heard, for having a voice. Um, and when told your voice doesn't matter, telling them that it does, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, ma'am. I wanted to give an example. You bet. About ageism. Yes, please. In connection with BGSU. Okay. <laughs> Super. In former days, <laughs> if I wanted to go to a, a performance, at one of the theaters, mm -hmm. I would call the box office. I would give my name, how many tickets I wanted. I would give them my credit card number. And then on the night of the performance, I would go into the office and they would have my tickets ready and I would get my tickets. I would go in. That's not possible anymore. No, no. Everything right. is online. Ah. Mm -hmm. And not every older person has a computer. Right. Even if they do, they may not want to do this, right? Because they don't want to give their credit card number mm -hmm. uh, online, right? And and so um, I had a conversation with a woman at the box office. Good, recently. okay. And I said, "This is age discrimination that you have made everything go online rather than by phone." Mm -hmm. And she wasn't convinced, I'm sure, but <laughs> she did say she had someone call me. I uh, had an assistant dean who did call me. All right. But I don't think that it's going to really make any difference. Hmm. <laughs> did you feel heard? Well, sort of. Sort of. Yeah, so not feeling heard isn't a good feeling, yeah? I mean, no. yeah, you have a voice and you had something to express that was important to you. And I'm glad someone called you back. I but too. I was very pleased. Right. But and not, another thing mm -hmm. that troubles me is newspapers. Okay. That used to be something that you could hold in your hand and see. Right. Now the blade comes twice a week in paper form. And now the sentinel is going to do this mm -hmm. two times a week. Mm -hmm. And and that's just not the way I like to read things. Sure. I don't want to get on the computer every day and see what's on. We have two that are online now, so we have a choice. But I, I, that's not the way I want to assume. And I know this is progress. I know that publishing places are having problems because they don't have as many readers that they're paying. Mm -hmm. and, and I can understand the problems. But still, I would much prefer. The main thing is what we're going to line our bird cages with now. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesdays and Saturdays. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it has more than just news, right? I mean, <laughs> but the interesting thing is, start fires. That's right. No, I'll find you know, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, it's interesting that you use the word progress, right? Because in some people's minds, it is progress, but who is it leaving out? Right. And so we tell students, we tell people not to assume that because someone is an older adult, they aren't tech savvy. Right. We don't want that stereotype um, because I imagine if I asked how many in here would be able to pull out a smartphone, how many people in here have a smartphone? Right. Yeah, exactly. It's right in front of you because I want to know where it is at all times. Um, and so we don't want students thinking, oh, the older adults, they don't understand anything about technology, they can't fix the Wi-Fi. Um, but on the other hand, if we make the assumption that we're all moving in that direction, who does it leave out, right? And so, yeah, so progress, I don't know. But, um, but then, yeah, and then we all want our voices to be heard. And, and, and I guess you made the point that you know, not everything can change maybe because I don't like it, but can I at least be taken into consideration and my needs and desires not dismissed because of, right, something that discriminates against people? Yeah, that's a really interesting example. Thank you. Does anybody else have an example they'd like to share? Because I, we, this is me. This is you. Yes, ma'am. I have two brothers, uh, one older and one younger. Don't have computers. Mm -hmm. Now the paper sentinel on Wednesday. How are we to know like obituaries mm -hmm. from family or friends? Right. You know, you know, uh, just don't understand why they have to drop all these money. Publication. Yeah, somebody mentioned money. I heard. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, right. But you know, the publishing industry is kind of leaving behind a lot of paper. But then that does leave out people who choose not to have a computer, right? People who maybe can't afford a computer. Um, people who, right? So that leaves out as well people who might be lower income, who that's not feasible for them to be able to access that. So a lot of people get left behind. Um, and what about the history, though, of the, the books or the papers? You know, if you'd go to the library and wanted to look up, yeah, they well, World War II started, mm -hmm. for instance. They're not going to have that. Mm -hmm. things will be on the computer yeah, and then the cool. net will crash or whatever, and there it goes. Right, because if your computer isn't working that day, mm -hmm. right, you have a meeting and it's on Zoom, and we've all had right COVID-related Zoom, mm -hmm. and how much that has changed our lives, mm -hmm. we will we will never know. Right? Which, how it how that has impacted our social interactions with people, our access to resources. Um, yeah, it's just it's just incredible. And and you're right, if those if those technology devices aren't working or the Wi-Fi goes down, right? Um, no backup. I mean, we have, I, I, I guess that's one of those things where you decide your values and if your values are, we need to keep our libraries, then we make sure we advocate for that, right? Mm -hmm. That we keep that element of history, that we keep libraries that are accessible, that are public, that are free mm -hmm. so that people can access those resources. Yes, ma'am. First of all, I want to commend you three girls. Um, I have a real problem with being put in a class called a senior. I usually go four or five miles a day. I use weights. I'm very physical. I have been my whole life. I came here because I'm on the hospital part. Mm. I have a boot right now. I went to a doctor three weeks ago who did the same thing right. he said. He looked at me, saw my age, and right away thought, you're doing pretty good for your age. Let's just do this. Did not... It did not go over with me. Yeah, dot, dot, dot for your age. Yeah. You're doing pretty good for your and age. He's overweight mm. and he's really a little heavy. <laughs> so you shouldn't even be giving me advice on what to do with my foot. Yeah. So I'm very much physical fitness has always been number one priority with me. Mm -hmm. So then when I call back in extreme pain, extreme pain on Friday. He just says, well, continue doing what you're doing. He didn't tell me what to do. <laughs> so I went to another physician. Good. The man walked in the door. He had that physical physique. He looked at me and he goes, oh, boy. And he knew right away 
how important it is mm -hmm. to maintain my level. Mm -hmm. It's like you get a certain age and right away you're expected to not keep yourself up. Mm -hmm. You're just expected to put on 40 pounds. And, um, and it's just, it's not, that's not what we are. And I don't like the word senior. Mm -hmm. I've got several friends. This place is next. This is my first time coming to a class. Yay! I, yes. <laughs> if I had my degree over, I taught phonics and reading in an elementary school. I saw a lot. Promethean boards, when they went down, there went my lessons. Mm -hmm. But I always kept a notebook. Mm -hmm. The cafeteria went down. Uh, they didn't even know how to count change in the lunch line. Mm -hmm. So it became a real problem. Right. But um, anyway, I have a daughter who is um, very savvy on computers. She's president of Kids Bop in New York City. My oh. other daughter is a surgeon. They mm -hmm. constantly keep me up with what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I don't like that stereotype because you get older, you're not of any value because mm -hmm. in lots of ways, you are much mm -hmm. more valuable. We'll be fine in going to the physician. So let's say you go with your parents to the physician and we find that physicians will often talk to you and mm -hmm. not to your parents although it's your parents who is there right even with cognitive impairment we often don't know how much people are taking in and even if they don't remember necessarily what the words were they remember the feelings they remember feeling dismissed and so another aspect about healthcare that's really challenging um but yeah being an advocate really important um and being an advocate for yourself is also then being an adv advocate for other people who might not be able to be so. And sometimes that means finding a new doctor, right? Which is a horrible pain <laughs> if you want to go through that, right? When my doctor said they were leaving the practice. It's like, oh my gosh, my life is, I mean, I don't want to find a new doctor. And so, but being your own best advocate, knowing that that is, that is, um, behavior you don't have to tolerate, right? You deserve to be treated with respect, and that may mean looking around for someone who will do that. Well, yes, you know, talk about tolerating. Yes. Um, just in this last week, I was confronted with you talk about questions and talking to people. Well, my girls are constantly on me. Our conversations are deep and in depth, but um, I I just got into a, a kind of an argument with one of my really good friends about um, agenda. Now I taught school, mm -hmm. so I didn't. I had a few of these little issues, but I told her, I said, "Oh, I'm not prejudiced. No, not at all. But you need to give systems time to adjust. Mm -hmm. uh, most schools don't have a bathroom right. that gender can go to. That's right. Um, so you need to just have patience. That's something we have to accept as being the older generation. And some people can handle that." Some people can't. I, I have to be open-minded because I was in education. I saw so many issues. Another thing that just happened two weeks ago, my son-in-law's brother's son is in seventh grade. The kids are allowed to come to school dressed as a cat and acts like a cat. I don't know if you've heard about this. They meow, they meow, they bark, and they come dressed as a dog. You girls have to know some people like that. Yes. One day they may be Sally, the next day they may be Jim. Now, you talk about being hostile. I could not teach. I'm not prejudiced, but there's rules. When you walk into a classroom, you don't have fur, you don't meow, you don't rest on someone's lap. You're a human being. And those kind of things, talking about how we absorb those in ageism, that's you at my age, even my own daughters are appalled. Well, now you have everyone doodling on their smartphones to figure out what on earth is happening. Oh, you do? Oh, it's easy. I have it. I my niece is in education. She said, I have such a hard time at Jackie because one day Bob is Bob and the next day he's Sue and he gets really mad if I don't call him Sue and I skip and call him Bob. So these are things that teaching, because that's my background, those are things that we don't have a lot of answers to. We're just supposed to accept. And in time, I'm sure we'll get over it. How about your generation? It's a little difficult to have. So you can't dress up for Halloween, but you can come dress up as a cat or a dog. It is. Stuff. It is confusing. And it you, you want to be open-minded. You want to be, try. like, accepting. But it, I, I agree. It, it is confusing. And it feels like sometimes you walk on eggshells mm -hmm. where you're just like, yeah. okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I agree. No, no, I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. I don't know about other countries, but in oh. England, yeah. if you're a senior citizen, you are known as an OAP. Oh, everybody's known as an OAP, which means old age pension. Mm. Mm. 
Whoa. And is that yeah. mint is a negative because you're now taking, no, taking from the government or is no, that a revere? Health care is free and you get the <laughs> juice. So that's why you're ah. a pensioner. And okay. you bring up so security. You got a pension. You bring up a really interesting issue though, and how some of this is different in different places, right? That we do have cultural differences. In the United States, um, and we could go into history lessons, right? When we're more agricultural society, we potentially revered older adults more because of their knowledge, right? How did we learn how to farm the land? We learned it from our elders. We inherited land from our elders, but things have drastically changed, right? Um, and the computer has something to do with that where, right, I don't call my mom anymore to ask the question, I can Google it. And so times change, as both of you were saying, um, but one of the things that we want to reinforce as we're running out of time is that regardless of those changes, regardless of those times, we all deserve respect, right? And so to think that because you have reached a chronological marker of some sort, that that means that all of a sudden, what you know doesn't matter. Your experiences don't matter. What you have to offer doesn't matter is unacceptable is not is not okay mm -hmm. and so we think about you know the more that we can educate others and yes we have some fantastic students going into the field elena is going to go into occupational therapy sarah is going to be in speech therapy and sarah is going to be in social work and so you know having people with a heart for working with people of all ages and understanding what aging looks like um, we have a theory where we talk about proactive coping. So, I mean, we talk about knowledge is power, right? But the more we know about what aging typically looks like, although we are all individuals, we can make plans for that. We can, right, plan for those things. It's like planning for retirement. Well, if we know about what physical changes are, are expected with aging or cognitive changes are expected with aging, then we can make plans toward that. So knowing things helps us all and helps us in our own experiences. Um, we can also, as I said, develop advocacy, advocacy skills, well, tongue tied. So it's just knowing when to speak up, up. So talking to your Congress people, right? Letting people who maybe are in power know the things that are important to us, whether it be policy or libraries or right um, newspapers. And then taking action, putting that into practice. So calling people out when you hear people using ageist language, just like in 2023, we hope we would do if we heard racist language, right? Or sexist language. But when we hear ageist language, we call people out on it. That, and that's not always comfortable, right? But standing up for ourselves, challenging um, ageist jokes or speaking out against discrimination. Um, I had a handout. I was going to share, Sarah, would you mind handing these out? Um, there's, a, uh, and there, they have some really good websites on there, but there are also things on paper. And so this is a, a movement that is talking about the idea of reframing aging. And it's just little snippets, this little boxes here, but they're talking about the idea of ageism harms us all. So it is discrimination or unjust treatment, and they're looking particularly at older adults. And that we learn these isms at an early age from whoever we grow up around, from the media we're exposed to. And so having different images to look at as we grow older. And then <clears throat> underlying ageism, excuse me, is an implicit bias that we don't always acknowledge it, right? We may have these attitudes that we don't always talk about. And then you can see in this little box down here, um, the uh, kind of like, this is what ageism sounds like. So when you hear someone saying, oh, I couldn't do that, I'm too old for that. Well, who said? Right now, if I have a physical limitation that is keeping me from doing something, and that could have been at any age, mm -hmm. that's different. But I'm too old to do that. Well, why? Who told me that? Right? Being able to challenge those ideas. Um, one of my least favorites, but again, this is coming from my perspective. I'm having a senior moment, right? What does that mean? We all know what that means, right? It's meaning that I'm not thinking clearly or I can't come up with a word. Well, guess what? Research says we all have those moments. We all have those moments where we, it's called the tip of the tongue phenomenon, where it's right here and you can't think of it. And then driving home in your car later, you're like, oh, that was the movie I meant to tell them about. That, that's brain cramp, right? And a brain cramp doesn't have anything to do with age. 
And so calling it a senior moment, and yes, sometimes we say these things to lighten the mood, right? To kind of laugh at ourselves. But the more we use that language and internalize those beliefs, right? The more negative it is. And so again, there are some there. And then on the back, what I think is interesting is they have what they call a quick start guide. And it's letting us know that our words do matter that are words that we say to other people, but then also what we're saying in our heads. So things like, as you pointed out, using words like seniors or elderly or aging dependents, that those words often other people put them as the less than, right? Now, again, I'm not saying that every time somebody says the word senior, that's what they mean. But when we hear that over and over and we hear it connected with derogatory comments, right, that those things become connected, then we think, oh, older adult means that, that, that. And we have a lot of individual variation just in this room. Imagine if we went out into the community or out into the world. And so then they have some other alternatives. So for that, for example, using more neutral terms, more inclusive terms. So I just thought this was, was kind of handy. And if you're interested, there are some websites or some, some links if that um, interests you. Um, so wanted to hand that out. All right, do we have anything next? Questions, comments? Um, I think, all right. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. Um, just to give a background, in the past year, our family has added a new baby. Mm -hmm. And our age range in our family now exists anywhere from less than a year up to the late 80s. Okay, and every bit in between. That's wonderful. Over Christmas vacation, my older son was talking at the table and we got going about all the different ages and what people are doing. And Sean came up with this idea, or this thing. I, I was just mesmerized by him at that point. Um, he said, you know, like this is my family here. My wife, my two children. On this side is my history. If you look around the house here, you'll see that grandma has out things that from her generation or from the grandma grandparents before that or the ones before that. And it is and it might be furniture, it might be dishes. You know how it is in our in our homes that we have a variety of things. Okay, back to his family. Then he says, now you the two of you well, and the other grandchildren, the five of them, you're building your own uh, future along the way. I'm fortunate as the father here, as Sean, to be able to show you the history from the past, from maybe the 1800s to 1700s, and you're going to be able to show us the future. Hmm. But I thought this whole idea was just... That's interesting. You know, I, I thought... Gosh, I wonder where he got that from. <laughs> and, well, and the fact that he's embracing that. And it was positive. He's Everything about right. the aging that's was right. positive along the way. That there are things we can learn from the older generations right. and the younger generations. And it also helps you clean your house up because the younger generation, <laughs> you can them. some of them do want, to, you know, hey, I like that from Grandma's house. They did. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I'd, I'd like to just uh, counter some of this. Um, okay. I, I think when, like, I, I was I was talking to somebody and I, I used the word old. But, yeah. Uh, this woman said, oh, my God, Marilyn, no. We don't use that word here. No, 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 no. And, you know, when we're denying those words, I somebody said to me the other day, well, how are you doing, Marilyn? I said, not bad for an old broad. So I kind of flaunt it. I think by not wanting to use these words, we are using ageism against ourselves. It's really interesting. And, and, the, and the distinction, I mean, they're not afraid to call themselves whatever. No, I'm not going to try this. That's right. That's right. And why do we put morality on chronological age, mm -hmm. right? Why is chronological age is how long you've lived? Yeah. Why do we shame that, yeah. right? And so I think you make an excellent point, owning that. Um, I think we're, but we avoid mm -hmm. the words, and that's we're saying something about. And it. how uncomfortable did it make other people when you, you said that? Well, I think we're, we're like, oh about, no, you wouldn't be old. Thinking about, mm -hmm. yeah, buy it. Yeah. <laughs> 
stabbed me and when and I said, you know, I'm 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 a you know an old broad. Uh, I mean, I'm doing fine for an old broad. But I think yeah, they were taken aback. Mm -hmm. But I think it's funny. But you were owning a joke of it. But in a way, I'm not making a joke of it because I think we're I, I think we're 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 taking on that ageism. Yeah. So we're going to hide it because we're going to say, oh no, I'm just I'm I'm just. What are some of the words we use? Uh, um, uh, we we use cute words. Mm. You know, cute cute mm -hmm. words to call. Well, and society is telling us. Or so oh, season. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I was told. Okay, oh no, and don't. Oh, <laughs> we are seasoned around here. <laughs> yeah. Like rosemary. <laughs> Uh, salt. Himalayan salt. What's that? Pink Himalayan salt. That's a that's, that's, right. a, that's a new spice, evidently. Oh, no, no, but I don't know. It should not be. Like salt. We didn't know. But then the messages are we getting from society that we couldn't look old, right? So we can yeah. hold you. You're young for your age. Yeah. And I go, well, what does this age look like? I'm not sure. But you're right, that idea of I've lived X number of years and look at all I've accomplished and who I am at this point that I wasn't 20 years ago or 30 right. years ago because of the experiences I've had, what I choose to do. And so it's owning that age. And I'll bet it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I, I like to think of wisdom. Yeah. Yep. I don't want to say, you know, necessarily that I'm old. I've got wisdom. Wisdom. Yeah. What is wrong? <laughs> Well, you know, no, but because I live long, longer, I can I have wisdom. I've developed. Wisdom. Okay, we have one question on the front row and then one in the second row, and I think we've reached one, so I understand people need to. Yeah, go. So we're so still recording. Know what it means when they when they come up to you and tell you to act your age. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> how, do you, how do you act? You know, sixty-seven. How do you act eighty-four? Explain to me. Yeah. Um. I think um, my comment to that person would probably not be something I should say. But <laughs> that would be the bigger story, right? And we get that across the lifespan, right? So yeah. The students get told to act their age. Well, what does that mean? They're supposed to be more grow up, right? Act your age, but not that age, right? Act more mature. But if you're an older person, act your age means what? You're supposed not supposed to have fun. You're not supposed to. I don't know yeah. what it means. You're not supposed to be silly. You're not. Yeah. Yep. That's what the middle fingers for. All right. <laughs> you know, she didn't like the term senior, but I, I'm proud that I am a senior. Okay. And I actually hang out here at the senior center. I work in the front desk <laughs> half a day a week. Um, you know, to me, it's like okay, in high school, the seniors kind of ran the school. You know, you. Oh, I see. That kind of thing, but. I, and I will say, my eye doctor, he's retired now, he's a little bit older than me, but the last few times I went to him, he would say, well, now you know, as we gain more life experiences, mm. <laughs> instead of telling me, you know, I was getting older, he had to tell me, and I, we chuckled about that, but, you know, I I think it's a perspective, and I, I, I agree with um, Marilyn. Marilyn, that, you know, I, I think it's how we yeah. Yeah. yeah, and maybe because I hang out here and I like the idea of being at the senior center mm -hmm. and, you know, but even back when I turned 50, it was like, I was still teaching and it was like, okay, I'm 50, I can say what I want now. And I, <laughs> staff meetings, I said what I thought. And when we uh, talk to older adults, we do see, particularly older women, we do see very often this feeling of, knowing ourselves better, feeling more comfortable with who we are, and feeling less afraid to say what we think. Mm -hmm. So some benefits associated with that as well. The fact that she didn't like the term senior, mm -hmm. I and you do yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, it yeah. just goes back to don't judge us by our age group. There you go. There you go. You know. All right, one more comment, and then I know we've over. Um, yes, yeah. you most discrimination that I find is if I'm at Macy's at the cosmetic counter. Mm -hmm. and so we have any talk about cosmetic. Later, a young girl comes in and she gets waited on right away. Mm -hmm. That's right. I first noticed this. It was you. Quite a few years ago, I was either in my 50s or early 60s. I was very excited because I was finally going to be able to buy my first Chanel handbag. Okay, right. So I went to that department at Jacobs, <laughs> and the clerk was on the phone. 
And I walked around and I looked at everything and she was on the phone. And after about 10 minutes, I went into the next apartment and said to the clerk there, can you help me over there? So she came over, got the Chanel bag out, sold it to me. And the woman on the phone looked at her and said, well, I didn't think she was gonna spend anything. <laughs> I'm still a full-time <laughs> antique dealer. I do yoga twice a week. I walk my dog. And next month, I've been asked to give a lecture in Wheeling, West Virginia on the ladies' accessories from the past. Fantastic. And y'all have done a really great job of demonstrating the diversity of experiences, yes. right? Yeah. And how we feel differently about different things. Um, yes, yeah. Can I give one more comment? One more, yes. Um, I'm ashamed of being called a senior. That's not, I was not implying that. But what I'm planning is, I have a lot of friends, they will not step in here because they don't like to be reminded right. of how old they are. Right. Right. You, you, know, you can take so that any way you want to do it. And I have two wonderful children and two beautiful mm -hmm. kids, and I'm very active. Mm -hmm. and I, it's not that I'm afraid of age, it's just I saw some negative things that happened with my parents as they got a lot older than me. Yeah. And I know if we don't have these kind of conversations, it's not going to turn around. And by the time I get there, I'll be subjected there you go. to not being listened to. I can be more older. Okay. You bring up an excellent point. Yeah, conversations make a difference. Intergenerational conversations make a difference. And we can have a different session on language. There are a number of senior center who, centers who have changed their name because people didn't want to go where old people were. And so a real difference in, is the language okay? What do we find acceptable? How does it label us? And then does it, how does it impact how people treat us? Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for your time. The little origami birds are just colorful. If you would like to say